Hello everyone, this is day five of unit one for world history. The topic for today is the Atlantic slave trade. Question number one is why were Africans treated differently from Amerindians? This is true for a number of very complicated reasons that we'll try to distill down into just one slide. As you probably know from a few classes ago, the Spanish arrived in America and set up encomienda, or giant farms and mines where Spanish or Portuguese men were allowed to take claim to the land and the Indians, the Amerindians who lived there. The rules for encomienda meant that the Spanish were supposed to treat the Indians with a certain amount of respect and care. They were supposed to protect them and convert them to Christianity. These Amerindians lived in family groups, often in their actual villages, um, near where the Spanish settled. The King of Spain, Carlos V, or Charles V, passed a series of laws known as the New Laws in 1542, and these laws outlined new rules for how Amerindians must be treated with care and respect, and no longer would it be possible for the Spanish to just enslave them simply for not being Catholic. In addition to these new laws that said Amerindians were to be treated with more respect, Amerindian groups, nations, cities, settlements, and every other grouping imaginable fought back against the Spaniards. We have a painting here of Pope's rebellion in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where thousands of Pueblo people fought back against the Spanish and actually kicked the Spanish out of New Mexico for at least 12 years. Additionally to all these things, Amerindians demanded a certain amount of respect because early Spanish men who arrived intermarried with Amerindian families. These Spanish men arrived with no Spanish women accompanying them and over time they found it advantageous and even authentic to develop relationships with Amerindian women, especially those from powerful families. And these men and women formed interracial families as we would understand it today. So the Amerindians not only were living in their family groupings, uh, they were able to rely on each other to fight back against the Spaniards. They were being actively converted into Catholicism. They were sometimes actually literally family relations of the Spaniards and the new laws said that they must be treated with respect and freed upon the death of the encomendero who claimed them as his property. All these reasons meant that Amerindians and their mestizo mixed race, as we would put it, uh, offspring were treated with more respect and were considered to be by the 1550s human. Africans, on the other hand, continued to be dehumanized. So as we shifted towards a more human understanding of the Indians, Africans who were captured in the west coast of Africa and transported to the Americas to be used as enslaved labor were continued, continued to be dehumanized. And this was made easier in several ways. Firstly, they were largely not Christian. Catholics from Congo aside. Secondly, they were far away from home. It was easier to dehumanize them as individuals when they weren't part of a family network and when they couldn't rely upon local family to help them in times of need. And lastly, the new laws did not apply to Africans. They were known as the new laws of the Indies for the treatment and preservation of the Indians and this says nothing about the Africans. So individual Africans torn from their families and societies brought to the Americas were treated as individuals and as such with no network of family or connections, it was easier for the Spanish to do what they already wanted to do, which is to treat them as commodities and as labor, but not as humans. The new laws don't apply to them and there's the added benefit as the Spanish saw it, of them being easy to identify. 
black Africans, as you can see in this drawing here, stood out as distinctly different from white Europeans or even lighter skinned indigenous Americans. And so when an enslaved African ran away from his master, it was easier to identify and return him Second question, how would captives cope with the trauma of the Middle Passage? The Middle Passage was an incredibly traumatic experience for every single person involved. The Middle Passage is called the Middle Passage for a number of reasons. It is the middle portion of a captive person's journey from their home somewhere in West Africa to their new reality as an enslaved person in America. Um, it also was the middle passage because it was sometimes the middle point of a triangular journey from Europe to Africa, from Africa to America, from America to Europe, and vice versa. Either way, this journey inside the bottom of a boat was a traumatic experience for all people involved. African captives endured sickening cruelty crowded and filthy conditions, whippings and beatings, and diseases. They were often not very well fed, but more often than not being well fed, enslaved persons, captives, would refuse to eat, going on hunger strikes as a manner of protest against their condition. Suicide and uh, captives jumping overboard was also a major problem in these journeys. Many people have estimated that upwards of 20% of the captives taken on the Middle Passage died along the journey. One way captives coped with this traumatic experience was to try to keep their spirits up as much as possible through music and telling stories of their lives back home. Over the many weeks journey on the boat, chained together or chained to the floor, captives had plenty of time to develop relationships with those around them, to speak and to tell stories with the people near them and to find people on the journey with them who spoke their native languages and who shared their religions and traditions. Singing songs and telling stories and comforting one another on this journey enabled people to cope with the incredible trauma by developing what are called fictive kin relationships. Uh, fictive as in fiction, kin as in family. So these are like new fictional families, new imagined families. Um, where the people who are on this boat journey with you become your new family. They may not literally be your countrymen from your country, but they become your family because they've endured this journey together. After arriving in the new world, another way that captives coped with this trauma was to resist and to revolt against their slave masters breaking tools, killing plants on the farm, running away, slowing down their work on purpose, pretending to misunderstand instructions were all ways to resist enslavement. Additionally, these fictive kin relationships continued to support the psychological well-being of the captives long after they arrived in the new world. This is a diagram quite famous from how you could fit a maximum number of captives on a slave ship. This is a diagram of the kind of handcuffs that could have been used. And this is foot shackles. Your ankles would go through here and this could be chained to the deck of a boat. And this is a group of enslaved men on a sugar plantation, possibly in Brazil. And I like to imagine that these men sitting around the fire are part of one of these fictive kin groups providing each other with support and care in their new tragic lives. The third question is, if Europeans needed workers, why weren't enslaved people treated better? 
And the short answer to this is that enslaved people were ridiculously inexpensive to purchase compared to the amount of money they could make for their masters. Enslaved workers, such as these on a sugar plantation, chopping sugarcane, squeezing the sugarcane for the sugar juice. Here's the juice coming out and into a pot. This liquid could be boiled down and refined into sugar and shipped back to Europe for sale. Sugar was an incredibly profitable product and compared to the cost of capturing and transporting an enslaved person, it could make the slave masters incredibly wealthy. This work is dangerous, it's labor intensive, and it happens in a hot climate. Enslaved people were easily injured on this machinery, were easily overworked and exhausted in the climate, and many, many, many died. Slave masters would make the calculation that it was less expensive to purchase new captives than it was to treat the captives they already had with care, respect, and to enable them to live healthy lives. Instead, they were an expendable commodity, a tool to be used rather than humans to be cared for. Question number four. When enslaved people ran away, where did they go? And what would happen if they were captured? In the Caribbean, in the West Indies, in Brazil, in many places in the Americas, enslaved Africans ran away in large numbers. However, their family groups, their villages, their towns, their countries were across the ocean. So they created new communities, sometimes known as maroon communities. Maroon as in marooned or abandoned, not as in the color. Um, and these were communities of people who had abandoned their life as enslaved people. These maroon communities were out in the forest, up in the mountains, in the hills, in any place that was remote from where the plantations were located. These communities developed um, organically out of groups of people who ran away separately, groups of people who ran away together, um, and they may go back and help friends and family escape subsequently. These were long-standing communities and they developed over hundreds of years between the 1600s and the 1800s. And uh, they developed community structures, buildings, um, sometimes fortifications. Um, there were children born in these communities who had never known a life of slavery, and they developed a culture all their own. They were not safe though. And this drawing up here illustrates some of these uh, maroon men defending their community against some white slave catchers. Maybe these are bandieras from Brazil. We don't know. They would use improvised weapons, as you can see here, spears and things like this. But they also had guns and swords and other things that had been uh, purchased in cities or stolen from plantations, etc. If these people were captured, if any enslaved person who ran away was captured and brought back to their master's home, they would be severely punished, tortured, whipped, etc. These tortures and whippings were in, uh, designed to not only punish the person who had run away, but more importantly, to strike fear and terror in the hearts of those watching to dissuade them from trying to escape as well. This brings us to our last question. If the Atlantic slave trade removed millions of people from Africa, what did this mean for the population that remained? We don't have good pictures to illustrate this idea, but it's more of, an, of a concept. This graph shows the numbers of millions of people who were transported to the new world. As you can see, it increases over time. And these are the locations from which these people came. If literally millions, upwards of 10 million people were removed from all these countries to be brought to the new world, this means that the population of largely men from the ages of 13 to 40 were gone from these societies for multiple generations. What does that mean for the population that remains? 
when you remove 10 million, mostly men, well, the societies become vulnerable. Without men of those ages, you don't have soldiers to defend yourself. Without men of those ages, you have fewer workers and the economies would suffer. Families would suffer without fathers, without brothers, without uncles. Um, and women would suffer. The women remaining would have to do all of the remaining jobs, all of the remaining childcare, all of the remaining everything. And it had knock-on effects because subsequent generations were smaller because there were just fewer men to father children. These are the five questions that we answered today. Write your summary and submit it online.